Welcome to the Hillsdale College Online Courses Podcast. I'm Kyle. And I'm Juan, and we are back with our last lecture on the book of Genesis. And this lecture is by far one of my favorite lectures of all our online courses. It's the lecture on Joseph. And if you are familiar with the story, even if you're familiar with the story, I dare you to listen to this lecture and not get teared up by the end of the lecture. It's absolutely beautiful. I think it's one of the greatest stories in the Bible and one of my favorite lectures. I, I love it too. You know, so much of the Old Testament shows the darker side of our humanity, our mistakes, our rivalries, uh, the ways in which we can harm each other, the ways in which we don't obey and follow God. And, and then you end the book of Genesis with the remarkable story of Joseph, his remarkable fa- faithfulness, and the beautiful scene of reconciliation that he has with his brothers, where I can't help but watch that and go, could I ever be in a place where I would be able to do that and act in the way in which Joseph acts? Dr. Jackson treats this beautifully and, and does a great job of, of walking you through it. We're, we're so excited to share this with you, and we hope you enjoy this final lecture in our course on the Genesis story. And I do want to recommend that you then go to hillsdale.edu slash course and continue learning with us, continue learning with Dr. Jackson. We have the Exodus story available for you. And and Dr. Jackson makes it a point that we're picking up right where we left off, right? What happens to the Israelite people after the death of Joseph? How do things change in Egypt? And what plan does God have in store for his people? You can learn all of that at hillsdale.edu slash course by signing up for the Exodus story today. And now we have our final lecture on the Genesis story, the story of Joseph with Dr. Jackson. Thank you. In today's lecture, we'll be covering the Joseph story, chapters 37 through 50, really just a kind of a pinnacle of artistic uh, achievement here in the book of Genesis. It's the longest and most cohesive narrative that we find in, in the book, all sorts of parallel structures that we'll see. And the parallel structures are predicated upon what we'll see as a penitential narrative. The Joseph story essentially gets told twice. Joseph's brothers who betray him, who sell him into slavery, and then Joseph in, in Egypt, but Benjamin returns. And we'll see that Benjamin becomes the new Joseph. And his brothers are going to be tempted to do to Benjamin what they've done to Joseph because both Joseph and Benjamin are the sons of Rachel, the favored sons of Israel. As I mentioned last time in our lecture on Jacob and Esau, the Joseph story really kind of begins when Esau comes to Jacob and we get to see We get to see Jacob lining his children up really in an an order of preference, in an order of of love with Rachel and Joseph being last. I always like to imagine at that moment when they're all being lined up, all of the rest of the siblings kind of looking back at Joseph here. And so that's where we pick up the story in chapter 37. And Jacob dwelled in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. This is the lineage of Jacob. Joseph, 17 years old, was tending the flock with his brothers, assisting the son of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, the wives of his father. And Joseph brought ill report of them to their father. And Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons, for he was the child of his old age, and he made him an ornamented tunic. And his brothers saw it was their father he, that, who loved Joseph more than all his brothers, and they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Here we have to all of a sudden wonder, you know, what is going on here? All sorts of clues. Notice here, this is the lineage of Jacob, Joseph, 17 years old. In some ways, the, our focus is immediately placed on Joseph. And in the entire narrative with his brothers, the entire focus is going to be on Joseph. My students are often taken aback because Joseph brought ill report of them to their father. Students often wonder, Is this just the youngest brother being a snitch? We have to hold that up as a possibility. Is this a a brother who's favored by his father? And in order to keep uh, himself in his father's eyes is being held up as the highest. Is this what he does? Hold on to that because I think the text later will start to answer our question. 
Oftentimes we think that the brothers simply despise Joseph because of his ornamented tunic, but the text sets it up that the ornamented tunic is actually a representation of his favorite status. And Joseph dreamed a dream and told it to his brothers, and they hated him all the more. And he said to them, Listen, pray to this dream that I dreamed, and look, we were binding sheaves in the field, and look, my sheaf arose and actually stood up, and look, your sheaves drew round and bowed to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Do you mean to reign over us? Do you mean to rule us? And they hated him all the more for his dreams and for his words. There are a few interesting things going on here. What Joseph will eventually come to be known for isn't a dreamer, but a reader of dreams. Here we begin in the, in the narrative, we see Joseph himself is the dreamer. And oftentimes uh, students wonder, why is he telling him these dreams? I think there are two ways of understanding this. The first one could be simply to needle them. Look at this, look at this dream, and all of your sheaves bow down to mine. Gee, brothers, what is it that this dream could possibly mean? And, we, and we're told, he, and, and they hated him all the more. But there's a second charitable reading. Perhaps he really is just curious. Perhaps he does read this, and he doesn't know what the dreams mean. He's not a dream reader uh, at this point. So I think, again, we have to withhold this. What does this we don't get his response to the dreams. And he dreamed yet another dream and recounted it to his brothers and said, Look, I dreamed a dream again. And look, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. And he recounted it to his father and to his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall we really come, I and your mother and your brothers, to bow down before you to the ground? And his brothers were jealous of him, while his father kept the thing in mind. And again, We do not get his understanding of this dream. It's just these enigmatic dreams at this point. And his brothers went to graze their father's flock at Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, You know, your brothers are pasturing at Shechem. Come, let me send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. There's that phrase again, Hineni. This this presence in, in front of his father, Hineni, here I am, father. And he said, Go pray to see how your brothers fare and how the flocks fare, and bring me back word. Ah, now we get to see perhaps that which preceded there in chapter 37, that Joseph isn't bringing ill report just in and of himself. It's his father who's asking him to go and look after his brothers, to see how the flock is faring. And it makes sense if Joseph is his his favorite. We could think of him as sort of this foreman right, who's sitting there watching to see what is happening. And of course, he brings back ill report, no word spoken if he brings back good report. But what's most important here is that at the beginning of chapter 37, now we can start to understand that he's not just simply bringing back ill report on his own. He's abiding by his father's wishes. He's doing this duty on behalf of his father. And of course, he goes and he looks to, for his brothers, and they saw him from afar before he drew near, and they plotted against him to put him to death. And they said to each other, Here comes that dream master, and so now let us kill him and fling him into one of the pits, and we can say, A vicious beast has devoured him, and we shall see what comes of his dreams. I find this moment fascinating. One, notice they're all speaking together. Each said to each other, it's as if they're speaking in a unified manner. And I find this fascinating because what you saw in the dream were all of the sheaves on one side and Joseph there against all the others. And this is going to play out in the narrative for us. And this really is kind of a transformation of this sibling rivalry. Whereas we saw Jacob and Esau kind of going against one another, one versus one, with one parent on one side and one parent on the other. Now you have all the brothers united against one brother, right, who is, in fact, the beloved of his father. And Reuben heard and came to his rescue and said, we must not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, fling him into this pit in the wilderness and do not raise a hand against him so that Reuben might rescue him from their hands to bring him back to his father. Okay, we have to stop here. This is, I think this is a really important detail in the narrative. First off, you have to realize Reuben is the eldest son. Whatever favoritism is being heaped upon Joseph, this really is something that ought to be going to Reuben as firstborn. 
And we've seen the question of primogeniture and the subversion of primogeniture, the law of the firstborn being subverted all throughout Genesis. So you have the Reuben, the eldest, who for some reason is trying to help Joseph here. And I think there's a reason for this. Uh, Reuben betrayed his father by sleeping with, with one of Israel's concubines. Right? This is that kind of break in their relationship. Now think about what happens if Reuben's plan comes to fruition. What happens? Just think about it. All the brothers over here versus Joseph, the one over here. And then they fling him into the pit. And then Reuben rescues him and brings him back to his father, his father's beloved son. What's going to happen to the rest of the brothers? What's going to happen to Reuben? Ah, think about this. What's Reuben willing to do? The other brothers are willing to just sell out one brother, that is to say Joseph. So they no longer have to put up with him. There isn't a disruption of the order in the household any longer. But what's Reuben willing to do? Think about this. He's willing to sacrifice the rest of his brothers on behalf of Joseph to bring back his father's favorite to get back into his father's good graces. But look at what he's willing to do. He's willing to sell out his brothers so that Reuben can stand there in solidarity with Joseph, his father's beloved son, and perhaps get some of Joseph's favoritism, some of the light that shines on Joseph to shine a little bit on Reuben, who of course has fallen out of his father's good graces. And it happened when Joseph came to his brothers that they stripped him of his tunic, the ornamented tunic that he had on him. And they took him and flung him into the pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread. And they raised their eyes and saw, and look, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming, bearing gum and balm and laudanum on their way down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, What gain is there if we kill our brothers and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and our hand will not be against him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And it's important to take note here that it is, in fact, Judah is the one who wants to find some sort of material gain in selling Joseph into slavery. Just take note of that, because this is going to become important uh, at, the, at the end of the story. And his brothers agreed, and they sold Joseph into Egypt, and then Reuben came back to the pit, and look, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his garments, and he came back to his brothers, and he said, the boy is gone, and I, where can I turn? And they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a kid, and dipped the tunic in blood, and they sent the ornamented tunic that and had brought it to their father, saying, This is a beautiful moment. Recognize, pray, is it your son's tunic or not? And he recognized, and he said, It is my son's tunic. Just think about this for a moment. They're showing this kind of condensed symbol of their father's favoritism. Right? He, he can see it, it standing of, the, of Joseph who's gone, but also that, that condensed symbol of their brother's hatred for him, of his favored status. And Jacob rent his clothes and put on sackcloth round his waist and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose to console him, and he refused to be consoled and said, Rather, I will go down to my son in shale mourning. And he keened for him. Just pay attention to this. Just think about this. Here he is mourning his beloved son, and all of his sons and all of his daughters rose to try to console their father. All of these children coming to him. And look at what he says. He refused to be consoled. I will go down to my son in shale mourning. Just think about in some ways what he's rejecting here. Rejecting the love of all of the children on behalf of his one beloved son. And they're going to keep this in mind. But the Midianites had sold him to Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's courtier, the high chamberlain. Hillsdale College is a small, Christian, classical liberal arts college that operates independently of government funding. And we want you or your son or daughter to apply. At Hillsdale, students grow in heart and mind by studying timeless truths in a supportive community dedicated to the highest things. Hillsdale College costs significantly less than other nationally ranked private liberal arts colleges and receives regular recognition as a best value. And nearly all students receive financial aid. Our robust core curriculum, vibrant student life, an 8 to 1 student to faculty ratio make for an education like no other. For more information or to fill out an application, visit hillsdale.edu backslash info. That's hillsdale.edu backslash info.
I'm going to have to skip all the way to chapter 42, Finding Joseph in Egypt. Um, But there are some scenes here throughout that are really pretty important, especially the Judah and the Tamar scene. We get to see a brief chapter as, as to how mercenary Judah can be, how quick he can be to judge somebody, how unjust he can be, and not giving up his own son, who he's afraid will die if he marries Tamar. So I want to leave that off to the side, because when we see Judah again, he appears radically transformed in the text. But there are a couple of moments along the way where we start to see that tough exterior of Judah start to crack, where he starts to have moments of introspection to where he sees his own responsibility in the lives of others. So I'm going to begin in chapter 42 after Joseph has read all of Pharaoh's dreams, after he's he's become a a high-ranking official, and now the brothers are about to come to him. This kind of bookend narrative for the Joseph story. Chapter 42, And Jacob saw that there were provisions in Egypt, and Jacob said to his sons, Why are you fearful? And he said, Look, I have heard that there are provisions in Egypt. Go down there, get us provisions from there that we may live and not die. And the ten brothers of Joseph went to buy grain from Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brothers, Jacob did not send with his brothers, for he thought lest harm befall him. So you see a repetition in the pattern here. Benjamin is now the favored son. He is the new Joseph to his brothers. You other brothers go because there could be some harm on the way, but don't let me lose my beloved son, the son of Rachel here. We're going to see this, the beginning of the structure here, the, the, the structure of, of the brothers willing to sacrifice uh, Benjamin, who has isolated himself. And the sons of Israel came to buy provisions among those who came, for there was famine in the land of Canaan. As for Joseph, he was regent of the land. He was provider to all the people. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down to him and their faces to the ground. And Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them. And he played the stranger to them and spoke harshly to them. And he says, where have you come from? And just notice here what's going on. Notice they bow down to the ground. And if you remember your details in the text, you know this is specifically from Joseph's dreams. When all the sheaves bow down to Joseph. And now you're going to see this same image of the bowing down repeated again and again and again. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams he had dreamed about them. And he said to them, you are spies to see the land's nakedness you have come. And they said to him, no, my Lord, for your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. We are honest. Your servants would never be spies. And he said to them, no, for the land's nakedness you have come to see. And it's this weird accusation he makes against them. You are spies. But I want you to think about what, how, what does this have to do to the previous episode that we've seen? That This second part of the Joseph story is a playing out of the first part. He needs them to see their misdeeds. He needs them to replay that drama one more time to get them to stop and to turn back from their ways, to see their errors. So why is he accusing them of spies? I think it's simple enough. Is that not what they accuse Joseph of being when his father would send them out to bring ill report? What is he accusing them of now? He's accusing them of being spies. It's a replay of that first story. Twelve brothers, your servants are, and we are the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And look, the youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. And Joseph said to them, that's just what I told you, you are spies. In this you shall be tested by Pharaoh. And I want you to pay close attention to these details. You're going to get two stories here that I think are, is a perfect replication of what we saw previously. You shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you to bring your brother. And as for the rest of you, you will be detained and your words will be tested as to whether the truth is with you. And if not by Pharaoh, you must be spies. And he put them under guard for three days. And Joseph said to them on the third day, Do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest, let one of your brothers be detained in this very guardhouse, and the rest of you go forth and bring back provisions to stave off the famine in your homes. And your youngest brother you shall bring to me, that your words may be confirmed, and you need not die. And so they did. Okay. There's a really interesting change in the strategy here. First, he tells them, one of you will go, and all the rest of you will stay. I think what we see, and then, of course, they get to discuss who would be going. 
But I think what you get to see here is remember previously what Reuben's plan was? Reuben's plan was to save Joseph and bring him to his father. This is the same structure. One brother will in fact get to go back with Israel and his beloved son, Benjamin, and stay there with him. In fact, I always like to imagine that during the conversation, Reuben would have pulled rank and said, well, I'm the eldest brother. I should be the one who goes so that he can be there with his father again. Nevertheless, notice it would be the one brother and Benjamin versus all of the others. So what Joseph is allowing uh, to have happen is really that same sort of structure. Will we give up all of those for this one? But then Joseph switches it. He says, no, one of you should stay and the rest of you will go. So that now it will be all the brothers pitted against one more, one more time. So he changes the strategy, but it is exquisite the way in which it plays out those first two, we'll call them sacrificial structures, right? To sacrifice one brother for the many, or in Reuben's case, to to sacrifice all of my brothers for Joseph to get back into my my father's good graces. And they said each to his brother, alas, we are guilty for our brother whose mortal distress we saw when he pleaded with us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has overtaken us. You can see what's going on here. The plan is working. The brothers are recognizing already the way in which that which they had done to Joseph is coming to bear here. Then Reuben spoke out to them in these words, Didn't I say to you, do not sin against the boy? And you would not listen. And now look, his blood is requited. Look, it's the same pattern here. Remember the first story. They all speak together with one voice. Then the first voice that singles himself out is Reuben. It's the same pattern repeated here. They all speak with one voice. Then Reuben speaks out one more time. And he even brings, uh, brings out, look, his blood is requited. And of course, Joseph recognizes all of, the, all of this. And he weeps. And Joseph gives orders that they fill their bag with grain and fill it with silver. And of course, when the brothers discover this, they're horrified. Now they'll be accused of being spies, be accused of being thieves. What Joseph is kind of reminding them of here is what he uh, was sold to in Egypt for, for that money. He's putting the money right back into their bags. It's this constant reminder. And of course, they report to their father everything that has transpired in Egypt, how now Simeon is the one who's left there. And in order to get Simeon back, there again has to be this exchange. There has to be a sacrifice. We must bring back Benjamin in order to bring back Simeon. And Israel's response is startling. Jacob, their father, said to them, Me you have bereaved, Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and Benjamin you would take, it is I who bear all. And Reuben spoke to his father, saying, My two sons you may put to death if I do not bring him back to you. Place him in my hands, and I will return him to you. And here again, what do you see? Reuben working so hard to get back into his father's graces. To to really offer up something absurd. Yes, of course, this will make Israel feel better. If you don't bring him back, he's going to kill his two grandsons. Reuben's so desperate to get back in his father's good graces. What he's willing to say is, I'll sacrifice my two sons on behalf of Benjamin. And of course, this isn't going to get anywhere with Israel. And he said, my son shall not go down with you for his brother is dead. And look at this line. And he alone remains. And think about all of the brothers hearing this. Benjamin alone remains. I will not send him with you, which essentially means I'll keep him and Simeon's just going to have to stay there in Egypt. Imagine what this is, what these brothers are witnessing here, all on behalf of Benjamin. And should harm befall him on the way you were going, you would bring down my gray head in sorrow to Sheol. It's the same repetition. He won't be consoled. You will bring my head down to shale in this, in this sorrow. It's a complete replay of the Joseph story. And of course, what we need to anticipate now, because of course we know they will be going back to Egypt and they will be bringing Benjamin with them. And now we move to chapter 43. And the famine grew grave in the land. And it happened when they had eaten up the provisions that they had brought to Egypt, that their father said to them, 
Go back, buy us some food. And Judah said to him, saying, The man firmly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you're going to send our brother with us, we may go down and buy food. But if you're not going to send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. And Israel said, Why have you done this to me this harm? To tell the man you had another brother. And of course, Israel will relent after they explain to him they have to bring him. He said, why, could, why would you have to tell him about Benjamin? Don't tell him about this. This is going to bring my gray head down to shale. And of course, in verse 11, Israel relents. He has to relent. If it must be so, do it. And of course, they go back. They take double the silver. They bring Benjamin to Joseph. And they meet Joseph one more time and they explain to him how they got the silver in the back and that they've brought back even more silver. And Joseph reassures them, all is well with you. Do not fear. Your God and the God of your father has placed treasure for you in your bags. Your silver has come to me. And he brought Simeon out to them. And the man brought them men into Joseph's house and he gave them water and they bathed their feet. And they prepared a tribute against Joseph's arrival at noon. For they had heard that there would, they would eat bread. And Joseph came into the house and they brought him the tribute that was in their hand into the house. And they bowed down to him at the, at the ground. It was that beautiful bowing down moment again, the dream coming to pass. And he has asked how they were. And he said, is it well with your aged father of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they said, all is well with your servant, our father. He is still alive. And they bowed down one more time. And he raised his eyes, and here it is, and he saw Benjamin, his brother, his mother's son, and he says, is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? And they said, God be gracious to you, my son. And Joseph hurried out for his feelings for his brother overwhelmed him, and he wanted to weep. And he went into the chamber and wept there. And he bathed his face and came out and he held himself in check. And he said, serve bread. And this is a stunning moment. The the meal is such a brief scene, but it's so perfect. And they served him and and, and them separately and the Egyptians that were eating with them separately. For the Egyptians would not eat bread with the Hebrews as it was abhorrent to Egypt. And they were seated before him. The firstborn according to his birthright, the youngest according to his youth. And the men marveled to each other. And of course, what they're marveling at here is that Joseph would actually know the birth order, that he can put them in the correct position. But I think there's another marveling going on. Here is a family that primogeniture has been uh, subverted, inverted the entire time. Look at this. All is right with the world. They must be thinking these Egyptians do things right. (laughs) Here it is, the eldest to the youngest. Ah, our order is proper. And he had portions passed to them from before. And Benjamin's portion was five times more than the portion of all the rest. And they drank and they got drunk with him. Look at what he's done. Imagine this. Serve the eldest first, second eldest, third eldest, all the way down. You're setting up proper birth order, the way things ought to be. And you do this and each is being served first to the last. But what does he do with the last? Gives him five portions greater. As if Joseph is reminding them of the favoritism that is there with Benjamin. So yes, everything is right. All the birth order is in place. And yet we see a favor heaped upon Benjamin here. And this, of course, leads us to chapter 44. Leads us to Joseph's ultimate plan to put the goblet inside of Benjamin's bag. To accuse him of stealing And of course, he has his men chase them down, accuses them of taking from from Pharaoh's right-hand man. He says, how could we steal from your master's house silver or gold? He of your servants with whom it be found shall die. And what's more, we shall become slaves to our Lord. None of us would do this. None of us would do this to our master. If you find the guilty party, put him to death and we'll become your slaves. You can see how this plays out. That's both of Joseph's story, where they think Joseph either dies or they sell him into slavery, saying the young one will be, will be put to death and we shall go into slavery. And he said, even so as by your words, let it be. 
He with whom it be found shall become a slave to me, and you shall be clear. And they hurried, and each man set down his bag on the ground, and each opened his bag, and he searched, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest, and he found the goblet in Benjamin's bag, and they rent their garments, and each loaded his donkey, and they return to the city. And Joseph asks them, Did you not know that a man like me would divine? Note what Joseph is going to do here. He says, the man in whose hand the goblet was found, he shall become my slave. And you, you go in peace to your father. Look at that line. You go in peace to your father. They know there will be no peace here as they go to their father. And this really is kind of the stunning moment. This is Joseph playing off of the entire history of what they have done to him. The entire history of the favoritism in the family. Because think about what they have now. Their father's beloved son, Benjamin, what has he been accused of? A thief. Oh, think about how delicious this could be going back to Israel. They go back and they don't have Benjamin. And they in, in Israel says, where is my beloved son? And they could look at him and say, your beloved son is a thief. He's an idiot. He stole from Pharaoh's right hand man. What would you like us to do? He's done this to himself. Think about it. They could rid themselves in good conscience to be done with the favored son. They could cut him loose. They could sacrifice Benjamin one more time, perhaps even justly so. He's a thief. They could sacrifice him to restore that perfect order to the house, which they've not had. The order of primogeniture, where there are no favorites, where there is no beloved son, where those two sons are always named as the only sons who exist. This is the temptation to sacrifice Benjamin in in a justified way to leave him there and to prove to their father, look at how wrong you were to favor this thief. It would be so easy for him to sacrifice Benjamin here and to justify doing so, to leave him in Egypt. But for some reason, Judah can't do so. He gives to Joseph the backstory. He says, And your servant our father said to us, You know that two did my wife bear me, and one went out from me, and I thought, Oh, he's been torn to shreds, and I have not seen him since. And should you take this one too from my presence and harm befall him, you would bring down my gray head and evil to shale. And so should I come to your servant, my father, and the lad not be with us. This is so important. For his life is bound to the lad's. When he saw that the lad was not with us, he would die. And your servants would bring down the gray head of your servant, our father, in sorrow to shale. For your servant became pledge for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him to you, I will bear the blame to my father for all time. And so let your servant pray, stay instead of the lad, as a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad not be with us? Let me not see the evil that would find out my father. In all of these sacrificial systems at this very moment, of the many brothers against the one, of the Reuben structure of taking two brothers against the many, of all of these exchanges that seem to be going on, the sacrificing of brother to reestablish order. Judah, at this moment, we watch it all come crumbling down. Because what undoes this sacrificial structure of thinking of oneself at the expense of others is completely undone by self-sacrifice. Judah, in this beautiful end to this penitential narrative, he who recommended that they sell Joseph into slavery takes slavery on himself. And he takes slavery on himself on behalf of one that, that he assumes is guilty. And he, and he sacrifices himself for really a stunning reason. And that reason is the love of his father. But let's put into context how he defines his love for his father. He sacrifices himself for his father because he knows his father loves Benjamin more than he loves Judah. And think about that for a moment, what this self-sacrifice means. To offer himself up on behalf of his love for his father because his father loves another more than he loves Judah. 
In many ways, I see Judah as the hero of this story. What would it take? Think about the love that he has for his father. To fear that he would go down to Sheol mourning. To be able to swallow all of that rivalry, all of the enmity that he has for his brother, and all of the favoritism that his father has been heaping on Joseph and Benjamin this entire time. And Judah is willing to take all that on and stay in Benjamin's stead out of love for his father. And of course, Joseph sees that the entire narrative has been disrupted, that Judah is broken free, that the Joseph story is no longer, that there is something new here. There is a reconciliation, that the brothers have come around. In chapter 45, we get to see the reunion and Joseph could no longer hold himself in check before all who stood in attendance upon him. And he cried, clear out everyone around me. And no man stood with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud and the Egyptians heard and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed before him. And Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me, pray. And they came close. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. And so now do not be pained and do not be incensed with yourselves that you sold me down here because for sustenance, God has sent me before you. Two years now there has been famine in the heart of the land, and there are yet five years without plowing and harvest. And God has sent me before you to make you a remnant on earth and to preserve your life for you to be a great surviving group. And now we need to turn to chapter 50, where we will see this beautiful reunion, but now a disruption of the reunion as well. The brothers aren't too sure of what's going on. Their father has died. The brothers have come together one more time. Chapter 50, verse 15. And Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, and they said, If Joseph bears resentment against us, he will surely pay us back for all the evil we caused him. And they charged Joseph, saying, Your father left a charge before his death, saying, Thus shall you say to Joseph, We beseech you, forgive, pray the crime and the offense of your brothers for the evil they have caused you. So now forgive, pray the crime of the servants of your father's God. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. And his brothers then came and flung themselves before him and said, Here we are, your slaves. Do you see what's going on here? The very end of the story, this is the dream of Joseph. All of them bowing down to Joseph. And notice how they understand it. They understand the dream precisely in the way in which they read this. Would you rule over us? Do you desire that we are your slaves? And notice what they do. They actually want to fulfill this dream. Here we are, your slaves. And Joseph said, Fear not, for am I instead of God? While you meant evil toward me, God meant it for good, so as to bring about this very time, keeping many people alive. And so fear not, I will sustain you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke to their hearts. And now to bring this, the, the story of the sibling rivalry to full circle, Joseph finally reads his dream. That the dream was never one about mastery or being a lord. The dream the entire time was about sustenance, about one brother, Joseph, keeping the others alive. He rejects their dream of lord and master and rather offers them to this understanding of this dream, this dream of sustenance, that Joseph will in fact take care of them. Joseph, the dream reader, now finally gets to read the dream of Joseph, the dreamer, the young man who didn't understand the dreams. He understands now. And Joseph dwelled in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw the third generation of sons from Ephraim, and the sons of Well, of Machir, son of Manasseh, were born on Joseph's knees. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, and God will surely single you out and take you up from this land to the land he promised to Isaac and Jacob. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, When God indeed singles you out, you shall take up my bones from this place. And Joseph died, a hundred and ten years old. And they embalmed him and was put in a coffin in Egypt. And this ends the Joseph story in really a fitting way. His altar notes, he dies at 110 years old. It's the age of perfection in Egypt versus 120 years old uh, in, in Israelite tradition. 
You get this nice Egyptian flavor to all of this. And it gives us a nod to the next story, Exodus, where we find Israel in bondage and slavery to Egypt. And that crowning moment of the relationship between Israel and Hashem when he frees them in the Exodus from that bondage and begins to lead them to the promised land. And so we can go back now and think about what we've seen here in Genesis. The divine and human relationship and its relationship to the human and human relationship. We understand that, of course, to be faithful to God is is to follow the commandments. But we also understand that one's interactions with, with our neighbors, with our brothers, with our sisters, that also has bearing on the divine and human relationship. And that the approach that we've taken in this brief survey of the book of Genesis really is built on a penitential narrative. That when one does wrong, when one betrays one's brother, one must stop and turn back and seek reconciliation. One must repent. And in doing so, one may find that the face of God opens up there in the face of our brothers through our own tears of repentance. Thank you for joining me on this brief journey through Genesis. I hope I've given you enough of a snapshot and kind of an outline of the text so that you can go back and go through the specific details of these stories, the stories that we skipped, and start to come to a greater appreciation of this great work of literature. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Hillsdale Online Courses podcast. If you want to continue learning about the book of Genesis or other topics, please visit hillsdale.edu slash course. There you can find over 40 free online courses, including American Citizenship and Its Decline with Victor Davis Hanson, C.S. Lewis on Christianity, Ancient Christianity, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Republic, and many more. The courses include additional readings, study guides, fully produced videos, and you can chat with your fellow students on a dedicated forum. Upon completing a course, you will also get a certificate. All our courses are free because we believe that a virtuous citizen is the best defense for liberty. So pursue the education necessary for freedom and happiness at hillsdale.edu slash course today. That's hillsdale.edu slash course. Thanks for listening.